Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television in Orange County. Today, I have the honor of being with Sandra Hutchins, Orange County Sheriff's Coroner, and today we're going to talk about her past and the things that are coming up in the future. Thank you so much, Sheriff, for taking the time to meet with us today. My pleasure. Just in very recent days, we know that the Ninth Circuit um, has changed its CCW right. policy or ruled that effectively um, the state can't refuse to give somebody a CCW um, if they believe in self-defense. So, Yeah, actually it's counties, uh, county by county, okay. and um, the case was a San Diego case, and it was the uh, Peruta case. And in Orange County, we have a similar case pending, okay. uh, identical to the San Diego County case. So we were taking a very close look at that. And so what the um, uh, two or three judge panel found on a two to one vote is that um, it was unconstitutional to require uh, good cause, that personal safety was enough. Mm -hmm. And because of California's recent change in the law on open carry, um, it did not uh, allow a citizen to protect themselves outside of the home mm -hmm. or a place of business. And so, um, so that is the, what we're following now, that law. So we posted a change to our policy on the website, mm -hmm. and we are currently processing applications that uh, have uh, personal safety or personal protection. We have asked those who may have good cause statements to include that uh, in case the case is overturned. Um, yeah, but we are what we are following what the law is today. That's terrific. Um, so let me ask you from the perspective of, I understand you're actually bringing in additional uh, additional reserves. Did, did the Orange County supervisors actually approve people to help get the process? Well, um, yes, uh, they. Uh, we do have extra help positions. These are people who are retired, but they've come back to work, so there's no cost for benefits. Um, or retirement, anything like that. That's great. So it's um, you know it's it, it's less expensive for the agency. They have the experience, and so these people are already here doing extra help work in other areas of the department. So what we're doing is redirecting them to uh, work on the background investigations. We have to do some training. Mm -hmm. Uh, with them, we have to get some office space, that, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so you're bringing in additional reserves and you're doing some training um, to help bring forward, I guess there's a, over a thousand applicants currently that are in? Right. There's, uh, last I heard was about 1,200. Oh, wow. And okay. we had about 800 emails. And so um, we, are, we are improving our response to those already, uh, even though we're still gearing up to, we wanted to maintain the three month process. It mm -hmm. usually takes about three months to go through the process because we have to do background checks and then there's a training component and and uh, the actual application has to go to State Department of Justice for and so right. we have to wait for that to come back. So we're trying to we're trying to um, maintain that three month um, you know or get as close to that as we can. That's terrific. You've been here almost five years mm -hmm. and I know you've been through some pretty significant challenges. What can the public look forward to with with Sheriff Hutchins? You know it's I, I stand on my record um, you know if you look at what I told the Board of Supervisors I was going to do um, when I was appointed and then in my um, swearing-in speech when I was elected, uh, I've done it. So I, I think uh, my record speaks for itself. We in, in this department uh, continue to lean forward mm -hmm. and to constantly look at ways we can deliver a better service to the community mm -hmm. um, and so I think that uh, is what the public wants. We are stewards of their tax dollars. You know, law enforcement is expensive. So anyway, as you well know, um, we're interested in technology yeah, and any way we can leverage technology to um, save money, become more efficient, and deliver a better product, we're going to do it. Uh, I have a very personal interest in um, in expanding our outreach to children and their families about substance abuse mm -hmm. and we have been doing that over the past two years 
and we have a drug liaison officer in every one of our cities that we police and in the unincorporated areas to launch an education campaign because we just we have a drug problem in this county like many counties and I think a lot of it is education if we can keep kids from starting down that path it's a lot easier than when I have them in my custody right. and now we're trying to reduce recidivism uh, with someone who's had a life of incarceration, substance abuse. And that's both uh, from the harder. financial savings perspective as well as saving potentially a child's future. Exactly. Yeah. It's saving a child's future, making them a productive citizen as opposed to being a drain on society and a cost, not just the cost of incarceration, but the cost of prosecuting cases and in and out of court um, is a tremendous cost. So that's the perfect segue to my next question, which is, um, the challenges of AB 109 realignment. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this early on, and right. and I know that it's been, um, you've already had budget challenges. You've done some amazing things with the federal immigration contract, mm -hmm. and um, I'm getting the feeling that the supervisors vote to not support the uh, at-home monitoring. Is that going to put that 20 or $30 million in federal money at risk because we have to keep more people in our jails? Well, um, they had approved um, electronic monitoring for uh, misdemeanors. Okay. And when I say misdemeanors uh, and electronic monitoring, we're, we're talking about people who have served the majority of their sentence. Right. And we're talking about the last five, 10 days of that sentence. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about misdemeanors that are nonviolent mm -hmm. types of misdemeanors, uh, putting them out on electronic monitoring, which costs dollars a day versus what it costs in jail if you right. start talking about medical care. And uh, we only use it as a, a population management control. So we would never, we don't, we don't put out everybody who's eligible. We just put out those that we need to, to make sure that we're not overcrowded, we're not subjecting the county to lawsuits. Which is inevitable, because that's the whole reason AB 109 came that's about right. in the first place. Right? That's what the state faced. Mm -hmm. So what I recently brought to the board uh, was a request to uh, also do electronic monitoring in the same manner, the last five, 10 days of the sentence, mm -hmm. nonviolent felonies, uh, and to put them out on electronic monitoring. And uh, they were not comfortable with that. I'm going to go back okay. and uh, explain it better. Um, because we're talking about someone, say, petty theft with a prior. That's a felony. Mm -hmm. Is that someone who is likely to go out and commit a crime of violence? No. Right. Um, and, it, and again, it helps us. There, there are certain misdemeanor uh, individuals I would not put out on electronic monitoring because right. they have it's a violent misdemeanor. And they have a history of... of, of Right. Violence, right, exactly. So we're trying to manage the population while ensuring the safety of the public and save dollars where we can. Mm -hmm. And also we're doing programming, but that's going to take a while, you know, to reduce the recidivism. So what's the long-term physical impact of having, I mean, effectively, it seems to me when you have county jail inmates that, are, that could spend many years now mm -hmm. um, in our jails, the, the medical expense must be ridiculous. We're seeing, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a great question. We're seeing, um, we're, we're having to deal with medical issues we never had to deal with before. There were some medical issues for people that were going in our custody but going to state prison that could be deferred until mm -hmm. they went to state prison, but that's not the case. They're with us a longer period of time. So, I mean, kidney dialysis, mm -hmm. um, you know, you name it, we, we, we're having to deal with now that. you have the so. transport cost, the actual out-of-pocket right. for the treatment itself, and so right. on. Right. Is there any um, potential positive effect from the ACA coverage for Medicaid? Is that going to help us at all? Our health care agency, who, as you know, staffs our jail and provides the medical services, has been working with the state um, to see... Uh, if we can recover some of the monies. The, the, the area that we think we can is in hospitalization, mm -hmm. that there is some uh, remedy in ACA. We get our, the inmates signed up. We can get some monies back for any kind of hospitalization. Right. And that would help a great deal. But I do see those costs rising, as they did in, in the state. Mm -hmm. 
is all yes, done. Yes, takes takes about everything. five years right. to, to build a jail. Yeah. So now I understand that you um, have a, quite the homeland security background, and you actually mm -hmm. spent time in Washington D.C. Um, for many of us here, especially in, in uh, conservative Orange County, the NSA um, overreach has been a challenge for, right. for some people. So um, I'd like to ask, you know, you had mentioned that you spent some time there. What's your view on on the current situation with the the NSA program, and and how do you feel about the the reinstituting of privacy rules that that we're hearing? Right. Well, I mean, I I think uh, they could have done a better job. I mean, I think the motives are pure. I mean, they're trying to protect uh, the citizens of the United States. We still have, as you know, very active threats out there, uh, and we'll continue to have active threats and. Um, sometimes we have short memories. Uh, we, the U.S. government and, and law enforcement agencies at the local, state, and federal level have thwarted a number of, of attack, attempts on this country. We have cybercrime, uh, lots of things going on. So, so I think the motives are pure. I think maybe we need to do a better job, all of us, in the law enforcement arena, in the intelligence arena, of explaining to the public what we're doing, how we're using it, mm -hmm. and and utilizing some of those protections like securing a warrant in some cases. And right. and it's how we use the data right. um, really is, you know, the question. It's certainly not hard for anybody to get the data out there. We found that out. For sure. Um, so we've got to do a better job in explaining what we're using it for. Yeah, and to me, from the perspective of the Fourth Amendment, I mean, what's the pain of getting the permission or the warrant and justifying the access is really right. from, from my perspective. I also think, honestly, it seems to be misdirected somewhat, the energy, because looking at what's happened with uh, the lack of cyber protection in our infrastructure, power, water, nuclear, um, right. there are much bigger fish, in my opinion, to fry than capturing people's emails. And well, there are, calls. and um, you know, the last FBI director before he left said our biggest challenge is going to be you know, cyber yes. and, and attacks on our infrastructure. So I would agree we need to do more to protect our homeland, um, mm -hmm. protect our systems. And uh, But it's got to be a balance. Um, it, it certainly has to be a balance. Everything changed after 9-11. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we need to stay, you know, focused and, and quite frankly, on guard mm -hmm. now. Um, that's just the reality. Okay. So you have... I think inevitably another four years. I'm making an assumption for you. Yeah. I won't expect you to say that on camera, but um, if you're given the opportunity to serve us for another four years, um, what can the county look forward to? Well, um, you know, I want to uh, continue, like I say, with the the uh, drug education. Um, we want to keep. We want to continue to keep the crime rate low in all the cities that we um, service. Mm -hmm. The Orange County Sheriff's Department services. The crime rate went down. Um, despite you know the concern over AB 109 and the economy and and reduction in, in police force you know in, in other areas, but it's gone down. So I, I attribute that to the hard work of the men and women of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Um, we continue to focus our efforts on our ethics uh, and our transparency. And so we will have occasion where we will have someone who does something wrong. It's just inevitable in any business. Mm -hmm. But I think the important thing is that we own it, we get out in front of it, we explain it, and we investigate it, and we let the public know as much as we can about that. So that's what, you know, the public trust is very, very important to me. And I think we've reestablished that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will uh, continue, continue to do that. And then, um, you know, this is near and dear to your heart. I want to, you know, be able to use additional technology. There's so many great systems out there, and and there's so much technology that could help us do our job better. But yeah. government has a hard time investing dollars on the front end to save money on the back end, and so that will be our our challenge: is finding ways to fund the technology that will help us do our job better. Well, I think doing the ROI calculations on that, I mean, you don't even have to look at the return on investment from a cash perspective. The, the technology today that, that can provide additional safety to the officers mm -hmm. or the deputies when they're out in the field is huge. 
Exactly. Um, the, the community response time, being able to find the location more accurately and better, and right. having communication that actually works when there's an emergency. Um, I'd like to see you know improvements at the OC, for example. Um, right. I think yeah, important. protecting the county at, at a time of disaster and helping us get back online as fast as possible. Um, and we're looking. I, I'd love to see body cams on, on we on every uh, deputy sheriff. We've field tested body cams, and um, you know it's a great tool for us, um, and it protects the county in terms of liability. Oh yeah, you lawsuit, know. lawsuit defense alone. Absolutely, and but we've got problems with the you know the uh, storage issue. Storage is always an issue for yeah. us. Battery life Video is an costs issue. Video a lot to keep. And, we, and it's at the crucial time, if it's not on, the question is always, did the officer turn it off or did the battery die? And so, so it, doesn't, it, it comes with its own set of issues, but I think um, the benefits out, outweigh those. I think you ultimately get over that. I've seen other departments with issues like that with GPS location information mm -hmm. that was conveniently turned off. And Right. You know, it, it was more because they wanted to go to lunch outside of their zone than it was because right. they were <laughs> trying to cause anybody any trouble. You know? so, of course, yeah. So I could see where that would be a challenge yeah. for you. And, and I do support, as you know, um, heavily the use of technology because I do believe, especially from the, a large department like this, that mm -hmm. the, the interoperational communications and the ability to support mass movement um, with accurate communications, for example, is a huge right. um, deal. And it's a big deal in the jail. I mean, there's a lot of technology I think we could use uh, in the jail. Um, there's a lot of intelligence we can develop from the jail. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of forms and things that we do that deal with accountability and medical care and, you know, inmate grievances and all that, th all those things could be captured on a tablet. You know, that's so, so we're still dealing with paper systems. And so yeah, I think you're going to see more of that. Right, right, right. Just from the sheer identifying which inmates the right inmate would, mm -hmm. would be helpful and not having to carry the big leather books around. Right, exactly. That they need to carry. I could see where that would be the case. I would actually be remiss if I didn't ask. I understand that there was a double homicide um, here in the county. Right. And um, to the point that you're allowed to comment on that, what, what, what is that about? Right. Well, we had a, a double homicide in San Juan Capistrano, arrested um, the son of the husband and wife. Uh, who were murdered, okay, uh, and his 19-year-old son was arrested for the murder. It was a case where originally there were a uh, few clues, but through the use of, um, uh, you know, evidence and, and looking uh, some for some video camera evidence, that kind of thing, um, we were able to piece it together. The oh, investigators great. were able to piece it together. They've been working around the clock on this. Uh, and then um, finally found it, found the suspect. And he is in custody. He's currently in our jail. Well, that's good to know from the yep. perspective of the safety of the community. And, right. And, and you know, we'll look forward to hopefully the DA being able to, to keep him there for a Absolutely. while. Absolutely. Um, what do you see as your biggest challenge over the next few years other than budget? Well, um, took away the one I was going to use, but it is the big challenge, but no, no, that's okay. It's a legitimate one. No, um, I think it's um, the, the, the challenge for us, um, but it's also an opportunity, I'll put it that way, is this AB 109 population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't think the governor had a choice. Um, I know a lot of people want to place this at the governor's feet, but this has been going on for two decades, this right. lawsuit with the state. And this and overcrowding issue. The taxpayers to pay. Right, and and we all agree that what we were doing in California wasn't working. Uh, recidivism rate was very high, and so while we were doing some programming, we weren't doing programming that was always effective, and certainly didn't cut down the recidivism. So, um, I think the challenge would be again. I, I look at it as prevention on the front end, keeping people from coming, new people from coming in, and that's where we have our youth programs. Mm -hmm. And then now dealing with the folks and trying to program them, uh, program them by that I mean provide education, you know, provide them the resources they need to go out and get a job, an get off drugs. Right. Yeah, and so a lot of times we would do that while they were in custody and then the moment we release them, there's no safety net out there. So, so now we've you know, partnered with more nonprofits bringing them into the jail, um, doing, 
you know, evidence-based practices and see what works. And we're trying to reduce that recidivism rate for the, what we call the frequent flyers, the ones in and out of the jail system. That's what we're going to target, not the guy that comes in for the first time. A lot of times they come in for the first time and I'm, you won't see me here anymore because this is not the place I want to be. It's the people who have been in and out of jail that we want to target. Well, I think that's important too, especially because if they're systematized or, or comfortable, mm -hmm. frankly, some of them with that system because right. they really don't have a better alternative. It's an important thing to at least show them an alternative if you can. Because, right. Because I'd rather not pay for them. I, people say, oh, you're soft-hearted. No, I just don't want to pay for them to be here. It's and expensive. Frankly, you're I'd right. I'd rather they don't break into my car. So if I can stop them from being a recidivist, I would be happy to see that happen. That's right. That's right. So. That, that's, that's exactly it. And that's been my message out there, regardless of if you think we should throw them in there and lock, you know, throw away the key. Uh, it's costing a lot of money yeah, that could be used elsewhere. It certainly is. Yep. Um, let me ask uh, w one question about, there, from what I understand, there was a challenge with the DUI um, measurements where there were cases or there were people having testing done. Right. And I guess the calibration was off. Can you give me a little bit of insight? Yeah, I, I, there? yeah I can. I, I can't get into the technical right. aspect because no, 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 I'm not okay. well versed in it. But it was a very small um, calibration error that was was wrong on the on the machine, and so the good news is they discovered it, yes, and and then we sent out letters to the court to the district attorney, mm -hmm. um, and so made sure anybody who was questionable and it really did not impact a lot of people because it was such a small uh, difference, but it was important that we captured you know that that error and and we brought it out. You know, now, is that error to the benefit of the county or to the benefit of the individual? Which, which way did the calibration error? I be think um, it would be to the benefit of the prosecution. Right. So that means yeah. people that thought they're walking away may not be. Right. Well, that'll be interesting. Right. To see, yeah. So. so. Well, I just had to ask. It was one of the things that somebody asked me about, and I figured I'll take the opportunity. Right. To, to, to ask yeah. Me. Yeah. You know, we've got to be, you know, very careful of that. We do use a lot of equipment in our labs, and we have to make sure that. You know, it's it's uh, calibrated appropriately, and we do testing, and so um, I think we've fixed this problem. Yeah. So you, you don't get a lot of opportunity, to, um, not that you couldn't if you didn't want it more often, but um, to, you know, to tell the community what you're about, I guess would be the way to put it. So um, if there's anything that you want to say really quickly, um, I wanted to give you a, a little bit of time to do that. Well, I, I guess I would just say, um, you know, uh, I've been doing this for 36 years, and, um, you know, I, I um, have learned a lot in that time, and so I, I, I've seen law enforcement go from being very shrouded and secret and uh, to being very open with the public, but I've also seen the public and this is the good news, get more involved and consider crime and issues in their neighborhood, their responsibility too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I really like to see that partnership that we have. And I think law enforcement is much more open to criticism, to ideas for change, um, you know, and I, and I like to look at it as a, a business. We provide a service. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've constantly, I, I tell my folks, we've got to be leaning forward. We've constantly, if, if, if we think we've arrived, we're getting behind. Right. Um, and that's dangerous for a large agency. So, so from, my, from my perspective as the leader of this department, I would want the public to know that I'm always looking for ways that we can do things better. Um, I spend my time developing my folks, developing the leadership in the department, and having them develop others so we have a good succession plan, including one for me eventually, because no sheriff should stay too long. Mm -hmm. um, and you just get behind the times, and it'll be time for someone else to step up. But I think in Orange County we can arrange for a smooth transition. Um, we have a lot of people leaving. Um, because it's just time. We had a huge hiring um, influx like 28 years ago, so a lot of those people are retiring, but we have a, a good backbench. We have a lot of people that so are prepared the to step producing up. The people that you Absolutely. We, we have had great, great people coming in. It, when, the, when there's a, 
economic downturn, we do well. We, we get the best candidates. Um, we have not lowered our standards, nor will we. We will always maintain our high standards of people coming into the department, because that's critical. Mm -hmm. And then we will hold them accountable, because one officer's misdeeds impact us, impact the reputation of the entire department. Yeah. And that's the message we send to them. Well, and they are expected to stand behind each other, too, when things go that's sideways. Right. So it's really important mm -hmm. that the right people are in the right seats and doing the right that's things. Right. Right? That's right. So, well, that's fantastic. Um, one last question, I guess. Um, I, I want to get to the point of, from your history, and we talked a little bit about this last time, as a female, as a sheriff, how has it been now, five years in, as being Orange County's first female sheriff? I try and take the gender out of it. Um, to me, it's, you know, it's not about that. It's just about being sheriff. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it would be different if, you know, I was the male sheriff, you know, how are the first hear. five years? It's, I, I really don't feel any, that there's any distinction. I think it has more to do with your reputation. Um, I think my folks know that, you know, I've done everything that they've done. You know, I've worked the jails, I've worked patrol, I've done investigations. I know what they face, because I've been down that road. So I, and, and so I think that's, it's more about that. Um, but. I will tell you, it, it's, what has been nice uh, is when uh, fathers bring their daughters up and say, I want my daughters to meet you because I want them to know they can do anything That's they awesome. want. The role model thing and I, I, I think it's good for young women to see not just um, me, not just a female sheriff, but, you know, you know a female senator, or, you know, um, a female CEO. Um, it's good to, for young girls to see women in those roles because they, they, they can see that it's possible. And I think your story from that perspective is pretty amazing because it, while this is an elected, appointed originally an elected office mm -hmm. on the second go-round, the fact is you started as a secretary. Right. I mean, yep. what an awesome story. I mean, yeah, it's, I started. It's like any other corporate huge American dream where you start yeah. out as the, one of the lower people in the, in the sense of the totem pole, yep. and here you are. At the right. Top of the, top yeah. Of the well, I mean, I and I think it's any job you do, you get something out of it that will help you whatever wherever you end up. So I like to tell young people, don't worry so much about what am I going to do for a living because yeah. it'll help you whatever wherever you end up. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much. Thank for you. Taking the time thank to you. talk with us. My I pleasure. Really appreciate inviting Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you very much. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Facets Television. With me today has been Orange County Sheriff Sandra Hutchins.